Hi, I'm Joan Kerber Walker and welcome to AZ Bio Peers. The AZ Bio Peers sessions are led by our leaders in our community and are a way to share professional education for us to engage and to share resources. So with that, I welcome you to our October session where we're going to be doing part two and focusing on convincing payers and buyers by calculating your project's budget impact. And with that, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Evo Abraham from the University of Arizona, and he will lead us in the educational portion, and then we will be opening it up for Q&A at the end. So with that, Evo, if you would please share your screen. Thank you. Uh for inviting me for this second session. And uh, I'll start with a little anecdote here. When I came to the US in 1979 to get my graduate degree, that was at the University of Michigan, I learned an expression there that is typical for the Detroit area, and that is uh, where the rubber hits the road. And when I talk about budgets and budget impact analysis, and really the process of convincing uh, payers or buyers that your product is really worth it um, from a financial point of view, um, then it always reminds me that is where in all of the economic analyses that we do in healthcare, especially product related, whether it's drugs, whether it's diagnostics, whether it's devices, ultimately we need to convince payers and buyers that this is worth it. So with that in mind, uh, I want to walk you through some key elements of what we call in common parlance a budget impact analysis, and that is exactly what it is. It is what is the impact on someone's budget of adopting a new, say, technology, bring a new technology into the mix of technologies that is available, bring a new drug into the treatment mix that already exists, uh, introducing a new diagnostic method into the mix of diagnostic methods that may exist. Let me start by making a quick distinction between cost effectiveness versus budget impact analysis. And these are two very different things, even though they often get used uh, interchangeably. Cost effectiveness, and I'm relying here on a great paper out of Peter Newman's group, uh, cost effectiveness is really trying to document that the outcomes that we achieve, and we discussed that a month ago, that the outcomes that we achieved, then the incremental cost that that entails um, is within certain parameters. So we may say that a new treatment is cost effective because to gain one additional life year or quality adjusted life year, whatever we're using, um, the additional amount of money that would be necessary is worth it under some willingness to pay threshold. So, and I'm not going to go into great detail about the cost effectiveness part of, uh, of the table that I reproduced there, but really the tension between something can be cost effective, but is it affordable? And think of uh, emerging markets. We may have a new treatment, a new diagnostic, a new device that in affluent countries is very affordable, um, is cost effective and affordable, but may not be affordable in, in any other market. So it is this tension more generally between something may be cost effective, but can we afford it? And it's really discretion of affordability that drives the budget impact analysis. Often budget impact analysis is really very practical. It is what is going to be the impact on the resources that are consumed. Um, it's from a payer perspective. We do it for a defined amount of time, typically three to five years. It may be even shorter, one to five years. It is dollars, dollars, and dollars, not qualities and life years or events averted. And ultimately, the lower the budget impact analysis yields, the, the results that it yields, the more affordable we can assume uh, it is. 
But what is a affordability? It is what you can afford as a payer or as a provider and say, within my budget, this is what would make something affordable or unaffordable. So there are no general standards out there in terms of affordability. It's really what it is for your particular setting or for the setting that you're trying to, uh, to sell your product to. Now, usually when we think about new interventions, and I'm focusing here on drugs because that is what I do most of the time, new interventions, and if you follow the literature a little bit and during the elections, it always gets ratched up, it costs way too much. We think the new intervention is inevitably gonna cost us more. It's actually a very dynamic environment. This usual expectation, new intervention, increased cost, actually needs to be balanced with other factors that come into play because those will determine what a payer faces or what a provider faces as they are considering your technology. For instance, a new intervention may increase clinical benefits, better benefits, so better outcomes. So it's going to decrease the disease cost. That's on the effectiveness side. But if the new technology is also safer, then it may increase the safety benefits and again, decrease the disease cost as they are, or the secondary uh, disease cost. And it is, if there are adverse events, then we need to treat those. So that may be lowered if the safety profile is better. So a new intervention may not necessarily be clinically better in terms of yielding better outcomes, but it may be cross-saving on the safety end of things, less adverse events to take care of, for instance. And then there's a third aspect, and that is time. And that over time, the changes and the of effectiveness and safety benefits may vary. And that that needs to be taken into account as well. So keep this in mind that this usual expectation um, is, it, it is valid, it applies, but that we really have to think about this dynamic interplay. And the example that I will show later, and it's a fictitious, fictitious example, um, I try to construct it in such a way that it shows those, uh, those dynamics. Now, what are the steps in the budget impact analysis? There's kind of um, uh, various aspects to it. It starts out with the scope and it is not only what, where, for what, for whom, why, and finally, so what, it is also the not in there. So it's not only a matter of defining the inclusion aspects, but as much the exclusion aspect. What does it do, but what does it not do? Um, and then that, that, that is a critical aspect. It is about the setting. It is about what patient population, uh, it is about what diseases, why we would do a budget impact analysis. And then finally, that so what question. Is this really the question um, or is this really the budget impact analysis question that we need to answer or might there be alternative options? It's assumption driven. And uh, as I said a month ago, um, you know, assumptions, it's always an assumption. It creates a certain amount of weakness, uncertainty. So you need to be very clear about that. Or when you read uh, impact, budget impact uh, model, you know, the assumptions evolve as you do the actual exercise. You set some, a priori from the beginning, but then during model development, as you're digging into trial data, for instance, test data, you may, have to add assumptions that then will propagate throughout your model. While you're uh, entering data, you're saying, okay, here are the data, but really it's not the total population of these patients that I'm interested in, but now I'm realizing here's a subpopulation of patients that I really should focus on. So during data entry, you're changing your assumptions and your inputs, and that continues during the analyses and onto all the way into the face of uh, interpretation. Now, a third element is, you know, who? And that has to do with 
market share or approach based on market share or epidemiology. If you were to do a search on the internet for templates of budget impact analyses, you'll see quite a few popping up from uh, the British Islands because in the UK, they have a very established and, um, and single payer system. You also see it in other countries, but the English language ones are obviously the easier ones. Um, and there they take the epidemiology approach. They say, of all the people in Ireland, for instance, you know, what, and population growth and males and females, et cetera, et cetera, how do we see this population grow? How many of these do we know have the disease? So they really come at it from a total population perspective. In multiplayer systems, that doesn't work um, because we cannot estimate it. Moreover, um, each payer wants um, his or her own um, budget impact analysis. So we use a market share. Uh, and in the process, whether we do epidemiology or market share, and there's an important concept, we create two worlds, a world with the new treatment and a world without. And as we estimate how many patients we might be treating, testing, uh, operating on, uh, we need to think about incident patients, there's the new cases, prevalent patients, these are new cases not being treated or having been treated, and then ultimately eligible patients. The eligible patients are going to drive uh, your uh, uh, market. Now, that will give you a picture of the total population, say all patients with a certain hematological malignancy. Now, then we know that as we treat patients, and you look, for instance, at clinical trials, that some patients leave a trial for whatever reasons. Um, and that's the notion of attrition. There is discontinuation that could be for medical reasons. You know, I really don't like the headaches that I get, for instance, um, or other side effects. It may be for non-medical reasons um, that they uh, say, you know, I've had it with this, or I'm moving away and be closer to a family member who can take care of me. There's also mortality that can happen while we're treating someone or while we're planning on treating, treating someone that is non-disease or non-treatment related process that people just happen to die, unfortunately, that is not attributable to the disease or to our treatments. And we need to do an adjustment for that because somebody who leaves treatment after half of the, the treatment has been given, we need to take that into account. That patient will be consuming resources. So for attrition in general, uh, we use a standard 0.50 that unless we have better data available, we say, okay, let's assume that this was a half a patient that we treated. Now, there may also be mortality that is related to the disease or to treatment, um, uh, to the treatment that is uh, received. Here too, we need to do an adjustment. And that adjustment can be based upon when in the treatment they die. And then we would do an adjustment based upon how long they were being treated and therefore how much resources they, uh, they consume. But you also see increasingly with all the advances that we have, certainly in therapeutics, is that some treatments are for a particular phase of the disease. And say, for instance, until progression, that when the disease progresses, then they need to go on to their next line of treatment, for instance. There too, progression is a form of mortality. It, is, it ends, your eligibility ends. Um, there too, we need to do an adjustment for the resources consumed. Um, same for intolerable toxicity. Uh, you see that often, say, certainly in cancer, until progression or intolerable toxicity. 
Um, again, we will adjust that, as you see at the bottom, we will adjust that for the amount of treatment uh, received. So that ultimately would get this population in the analysis. And yes, it is okay to think in number of patients, but they, what it really is, is the number of whole patients. Because we're going to have, say, if we have two patients who uh, uh, have attrition from a study for non-medical reasons, we really have one patient that we need to count. So think of now, we're not talking about patients as individuals, but patients as counts of proportions of patients, most of them 100%, but then some of them may be 50%, some of them may be based upon the amount of treatment. So that this population in analysis is the patients who were discontinued or died, plus then the progress patients. And we're going to do then, this is where our two worlds start, without and with. So a world without the new treatment, and a world with the new treatment where old and new treatment have their relative uh, market shares or epidemiology. Another element is adverse events. Adverse events can cost a lot of money. Uh, if somebody who is treated with chemotherapy has a uh, episode of febrile neutropenia, which is potentially life-threatening, Estimate there is in 2021 dollars, about $35,000, probably just for the hospitalization and related medical expenses. So you, you know, every patient who will develop or is at risk of developing febrile neutropenia is going to cost us a good amount of money. There are even other diseases, conditions that are even more costly. Say you have an adverse effect on kidneys. Um, and then there is a certain percentage of patients who may have to go on dialysis. Well, then you're talking about much higher, even much higher costs. So we need to take into account the type, the rate, and the costs of adverse events. And then also whether these adverse events happen in the pre or the world without and or in the world with. So then finally, we're going to get closer to our actual uh, budget impact components. First thing we want to know is what is the gross budget impact of my innovation? So basically telling a payer or a provider over five years, over three years, whatever, over five years, you will be laying out X billion of dollars. I'm just making up a number. Um, that is going to be your gross budget impact, irregardless of all the other ones. We can also look at aspects of the gross budget impact. We can have a partial gross budget impact. It's the treatment alone. You can do it for the medication. You can uh, do it for acquisition of a device, for instance. And again, we're going to do that in our two worlds, the world with and the world without the new in innovation. And then finally, we're going to come in that gray box to the result that we really are interested in is how does this gross budget impact now translate in a net budget impact um, that takes into account the difference between the two worlds. So the net budget impact, as you see here to the right, is the gross budget impact of your innovation plus then the cost of comparators adjusted for new market share proportions. So the cost of comparators in the, with your innovation minus the cost of comparators without. Now this is all nicely uh, bundled together in terms of all of the principles. Let's now look at a particular example. Let's say it's a hematological malignancy that our current treatment is a combination of chemotherapy. So think systemic chemotherapy, lots of adverse events and a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So we'll call that chemo TKI or chemo TKI. We know 
we have trial data. Um, so, and the trial was two progression, toxicity, or two years maximum. What we also know is from the trial or trials that the progression-free survival. So if it is to progression, if you progress, you know, that's the end of treatment. Progression-free survival was 11.33 months. And that because of the chemo that we also need to administer something to prophylact, prevent febrile neutropenia. Our new treatment is going to be yet another monoclonal antibody. I would call it Novomap. New monoclonal, similar trial to progression, toxicity, or two years. But here, our progression-free survival is five months longer, 16.33. So why is the progression-free survival important here? It's because of that adjustment that we're going to have to make. Of the current treatment, we're only gonna to have to pay 11.33 months of treatment. For new treatments, we're going to have to pay 16.33 uh, months of treatment for patients who progress, not patients who um, uh, proceed through the whole trial. Let's now think of how many patients are we talking about, whether this is US annual incident cases, or let's just, think then this is Medicare and we know that Medicare might be um, potentially making a decision as to whether to cover, I just made a number here, made, made up a number, 7,351 patients. Finally, a budget impact analysis should reflect your strategy. So here, let's say we're going for a niche indication. One of these hematological malignancies with a clearly defined um, genetic profile, signature, et cetera. So very niche indication. So we're not talking about a huge population. We may price our product a little bit higher, although what we're now seeing, now that we have so many monoclonal antibodies trying to get on the market, um, then actually the prices are coming down and it puts those of the first generation, the Nobel Prize winning uh, treatments that we, we have, that they're much higher price. So if you can come in lower and with a better profile or at the same level, but with a better safety profile, you're going to have these dynamics that I mentioned earlier. So, and that your strategy is to compete on efficacy and on safety. So, base it in from the spreadsheets that we use, made up an example, you see here your epidemiology, total number of patients. We know US population grows by a certain percentage, so we can project out if the incidence of this disease stays the same, that every year we're going to add a few patients. But in the end, we are talking about 37 patients, individuals, 37, 200 individual patients that um, um, have the disease. And let's assume that all of them are eligible for the new treatment according to the label then uh, you may be negotiating, let's say, with the FDA. So then eligible population is the same as the total number of patients, uh, just to keep things a little bit easier. Market share, you do your market research and you get the results back and they tell you, okay, once your drug comes on the market, Novomap comes on the market, it's going to already have a certain first year market penetration, market share. And because of the strategy that you develop, it will gain more and more. Whereas then our chemo Tiki may start at about 75% of market share, but decline. So now you have the factor of time playing here. 
in interaction with market share. So remember that was one of the elements. Obviously the market share, the total market is still at a hundred. But those 37,200 patients are the potential patients. But we know if we were to start treating all of them and 7,000 some every year, then some of them will drop out of treatment. But the trials show that Novomap actually has a better discontinuation, so non-medical discontinuation profile than chemotiki. And we assume that that stays constant over time because we don't have data to um, uh, indicating differently. Mortality may also needs to be taken into account. And let's say more, uh, Novomap has a better uh, mortality profile than chemotiki. So here you see then two other elements are coming in. Obviously our 37,200, we will need to now start adjusting for discontinuation plus mortality equals attrition. So we know we don't have that attrition. There will be fewer people, but it's not a loss of individuals with discontinuation and mortality, assuming it's normally distributed. We can say on average, they got 50% of the treatment. So then it is really 1.67 people, individuals, total people um, that we lose, for instance, to discontinuation. So now we have our population after the attrition. We're going to start looking at this now in our world without just chemotiki or in our world with where Novomap and chemotiki compete. And from our market research, we know that the market share of Novomap will go up, whereas the market share of chemotiki will be going down. I'm not going to go into all of the lines here, but you see here what happens. We anticipate 7,351 patients treated with chemotiki in the world without really after we uh, count the discontinuation, the death, the total attrition, but then really we only lose half of these because we treat, treat them for half of the time, that the residual population, this is before progression, is 6,340 and you know, continues proportionately. Now, if we take into account, and this is discontinuation mortality rates for chemotherapy only, if we now take into account the differential, lower here, differential discontinuation and mortality rates, for Novomap and Chemotiki, you see that these proportions start changing. Market share increases from 1,800 to 5,600 patients or residual population after we adjust, 1,700 to 5,300, whereas for Chemotiki from an initial 4,000, 800, let's say it declines to about one third of that because of this decline in market share. So you see one goes up, the other one goes down, and this is an important dynamic to consider. So we have now our populations, and I, this is a little bit of a repeat, um, but I wanted to highlight something here, and that is just the fact then lower discontinuation rates, lower mortality rates for our new Novo map is translating into not 32 of our 37,000 patients being treated, but we're now treating 1,700 patients more roughly. So because of the lower discontinuation and lower mortality rates, we're actually seeing a gain in patients benefiting. So there is here 
a humanistic factor at play as well that is important. And that is important to highlight in the dynamics of a budget impact analysis. Now we need to go to the actual clinical outcomes, and it is progression. Let's say the trials have shown that Novomap um, has a two-year progression rate, so over the first 24 months the, of 19.86%, whereas chemotiki, really, we know, shorter um, uh, progression-free survival time, then it's 48 Point fifteen. So we calculate then our adjustment factor. We know that the trial time horizon was 24 months, that our Novomap patients had a median 16.33. So we can assume that a Novomap treated patients, patient who progresses, received 68% of their treatment. Whereas for chemotiki, it is 47.21. What this also means is we're going to be spending more money on Novomap, less money on Chemotiki because we don't have to treat these patients as long. And I know that that sounds like a strange way of saying it, but that is a dynamic to be considered. So now we can come to our adjusted population. And I just want to uh, focus here on the yellow highlighted lines. We have our adjusted population um, in the world without, the adjusted populations too in the world with. And if you really look now here at the bottom, lower right hand corner, in the world without, we end up treating the equivalent of 26,500 patients. In the new world, yeah, okay, that's maybe not the way, or the world with the new drug. That's 4,100, well, 4,000 higher. So here we're now saying we will have 4,000 complete, quote unquote, complete patients treated more with Novomap. So the question then becomes, is this a significant improvement that is affordable? and that is actually worth it, but is affordable. But we still have to consider our adverse events. And we know chemotiki has chemo in there, and let's assume it's really one of the very myelotoxic chemotherapy regimens that uh, you know, suppresses your bone marrow, you're not making white blood cells anymore, the precursors you're not making, red blood cells anymore. So good part of the patients are going to become neutropenic, anemic, thrombocytopenic. And you see, these are all treatments with a significant cost associated with it. Uh, and this is not even considering febrile neutropenia. And let's say the chemo, oh, my apologies. The chemo is also uh, hard on the kidneys that over one third of patients may really have acute kidney injury and need to be treated for that at a at um, 57,000 yeah, 57, uh, cases. So you see here now that in the lower right hand corner, yellow highlighted line, then if we stay in the world without this new drug, in addition to all the drug costs, you payer, you provider will have to cover about $1.3 billion for these 7,500 patients in adverse event treatments. And that's a pretty significant cost. So again, multiple dynamics, maybe a better safety profile would translate into savings. And then let's say now then once we look at uh, the world with the new drug, Novomap, Chemotiki, and I'm gonna just highlight, watch my cursor here, then, and of course, yeah, I made this come out in favor of Novomap, 
then Novomab, like a lot of monoclonal antibodies, has very low uh, side effects. Now, it has some other ones that perhaps should have been included here, but for the sake of the exercise, that really in the world with Novomab, as market share increases, you see that here in those numbers, as market share increases, the impact is going to be $30.6 million to manage the adverse events of Novomap over five years. Whereas in the meanwhile, since Chemotiki is declining in market share, so also the adverse event numbers will be declining, then still you will have about three, uh, two thirds of a billion dollars um, of adverse event cost to manage. So we're getting closer now to our real summary, but we still need to add one element or an important element, and that is our medications and administrations. And um, I'm only showing it here for year one. The spreadsheets are programmed that then it populates and well, propagates into subsequent years adjusted for medical um, or medications, um, inflation, and so on. But let's say that the manufacturer says, okay, you know, I'm going to price this at 176, 121.81. Now, why is this such a number? Uh, you may say the unit cost is so much, but we treat, say, for instance, based upon body surface area or some other metrics, but then the modal cost would be $176,000 for this treatment. Now, it is needs to be administered and there, you know, Medicare, according to the CPT codes or the, the HIPPIX codes, uh, would be 9,973.21 for every patient to administer that over the course of the treatment. And yes, then 176 is a little bit higher than chemo -tiki. Now chemo -tiki, there you have the TKI and then you have chemotherapy. So probably the TKI would have been, let's say about 125,000, but there is all the other chemo that is added onto it. Plus, we know these patients are at high risk of myelosuppression, so suppression of the bone marrow. So we're going to give them backfilgerstim uh, to prophylact them against, certainly um, uh, against um, a neutropenia. And so we have that cost. And let's say that chemo TKI takes up more chair time. So our administration cost for Chemo TKI is about 5,000, 5,500, 600, 700, more expensive than Novomap. But we also need to then have, say, six administrations of pet filtering, say, at the start of each cycle. So we now have these costs. Now, um, these cost models, you know, there's worksheets in the back there, you need to really calculate this out. This is where you're, if you're doing drug related type of things, you need to have a very good pharmacist who is totally up on those in calculations to help you figure that out. So we have our medications now, finally as well. So we can now start thinking about what is the budget impact here. So I didn't put in the full sheet, um, but the executive summary sheet. Remember, we start out with our eligible population, and then we also calculated that without um, a Novo map, ultimately we're talking about the equivalent of 5,200 some treated patients, fully treated patients, but after market entry. Already here, we see an increase of about 400. And here is that number then that I showed earlier. Okay, we start out with 37. With 
adjustments and so on, ultimately uh, we can treat either without Novo map on the market 26, or we can treat 30,000 uh, patients. It's really a difference of 10%. 26 out of 37 was 71%, I think. 30 out of 37 was 81%. So you see here that with Novomap coming onto the market, then you as a provider and a payer will be treating more patients. So there is this humanistic uh, component um, here, patient-centric component that is very important, obviously, to consider. Now, we know first element in a budget impact is what is the gross impact, uh, budget impact of introducing Novomap. And, you know, here you have market share that increases. Um, we have the cost per treatment proper data over the five years. So we also have the total cost per patient which increases over five years by quite a bit, right? about 50, a uh, little bit more than $50,000, so that our total treatment costs will go from 186 times 1674, 311, 312 million dollars in the first year, and will increase as Novo Map is projected uh, to gain market share to 1.2. Um, billion uh, for a total cost of four billion. So you're basically telling the payer, um, we project that you will be spending four billion dollars over five years uh, to treat just the treatment cost to treat with um, Novo Map, and on top of that comes and I shouldn't use my mouse. Whoop. And on top of that comes another 30 million and a bit um, of adverse event management. So count on a solid $4 billion that you will need 4.05 billion that it will cost you to buy my product. So because that's basically what you're saying as, uh, as a vendor. But let's put that in, within context. Let's put it within context of what if you were to not adopt Novomap and stay with Chemotiki? Well, you are looking at seven and a half billion dollars, which is 1.4 billion in treatment costs, which is not that much different from what you would be paying for Novomap, but you have a tenfold higher rate, a uh, tenfold higher cost, roughly. Um, of um, uh, managing, no, not tenfold. I don't remember the exact number, um, but you're going to be spending a lot more money on, um, on adverse event management. Now, if you decide to um, bring Novomap into your treatment mix, your chemotiki costs are going to go down to $3.4 uh, billion. You're still going to pay for treatment, obviously, but you're also going to have in declining order because of your declining market share or the declining market share of chemotiki, still a significant proportion of adverse event costs. Now, remember, definition of net budget impact. So this is drum roll now. Net budget impact is your gross budget impact of introducing the new treatments plus the comparator costs with, so adjusted for Novomap in um, the treatment mix, minus the comparator costs if you would not include Novomap. And here you see it, of course, I made these numbers, you know, um, and they're fake numbers, fictitious numbers. And basically your message to a payer is, okay, in your first year, while uh, my new treatment is trying to 
get off the grounds, you'll be paying 650 million, um, 650 thousand dollars more um, in treatments for this hematological malignancy. But over the years, with Novomab gaining market share, with its somewhat better, well, quite better um, uh, survival benefit, progression-free survival benefit, an additional five months, progression-free survival, much lower adverse event cost, you stand, stand to save $66 million over five years. So about um, that 12 million, yeah, 12 million and a bit a year um, in today's dollars and inflation adjusted well, from today's dollars, inflation adjusted. So what I tried to do here, and as I said, these are fake data, um, but to show really an example where introducing a strategically priced product and budget impact analyses inform the pricing people within the company. So you should think about that. You know, yeah, we have our traditional pricing methods, but start running scenarios of where can I price it in such a way that I have an affordable treatment that I can convince payers or providers to buy my, my technology. And if you can say that either for the same money, you're gonna get either better outcomes or less safety problems, or ideally the two, then you are in a very compelling situation. So with that, we have about 12, 13 minutes left. Um, let me open the chat, see what, um, whether there are questions there. Hi, Evo. This is Joan. I'll make it easy yeah. for you because I've been monitoring the chat as we go. Okay, great. So um, question number one is everybody absolutely loves your model. And they would like to know if they can have the worksheet so that they can play with it. Um, actually, um, well, and Natalie and I will be talking about that. Um, if I, I, there's no objection to giving you uh, the worksheets, but there's so many intricacies that it's better than um, I, that, that we create a mechanism where I can walk people through the worksheets. Um, because I only gave you kind of the, the shiny top level. Um, but, but you know, and to do this on a AZ Bio Pierce type of model, and you know, I'm up in Phoenix for teaching uh, a couple times a month, so th that we approach it that, that way. If it, when I share you know, our spreadsheets with students, um, you know, I have to spend a lot of time with them to really help them understand what you do here in, and there's a tab that is assumptions and inputs, and it runs for a few hundred lines. Um, what you do here propagates out uh, into other areas. You cannot do two things at the same time, for instance. So, um, yeah, I'd like to take a little bit more of a coaching or introduction type of approach, spend time at Big Land. Yeah, that's, that is not the problem. That's part of my, my job. So, um, so that, that would be the, the approach that, that I recommend. Now, there are some um, good templates out there. And what I can do, um, Joan, I can dig those up and email them to you. Uh, they're totally in the public domain. So um, uh, yeah, that's. Terrific. Thank you. And um, I think Office Hours with Evo has a great ring to it. Maybe we'll have to set that up for next year. Yeah. So. All right. Another question. Um, 
And this has to do with, you know, when we look at a model like this, we very often model it as, you know, we have a body of patients. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is we have multiple subsets of valid bodies of patients, right? We have the private payer patients, the VA patients, the Medicare patients, yeah. the, um, the Medicaid patients. So as companies are, are trying to understand this, where do they find the data that breaks that down so that they can understand, you know, how to address some very, very different payer communities? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and that is here, I just assumed was one pair, but you're mm -hmm. totally correct. You got commercial, you got Medicare, you got Medicare Advance. You, you need to figure out uh, the overall uh, payer mix. Um, it, sometimes it takes really a lot of you know, trying to find sources. Now, ever since we finally had the great invention of the internet, all of that has gotten a lot easier than it used to be before. But um, if you were to uh, pitch this to a payer, you know, um, and say, you know, I can come up and do my presentation with numbers that I think would work. Then on the other hand, you could say to the payer, I need these numbers. What is your commercial? What is your Medicare advantage? Let's say you're going to do this for United Healthcare or something like that. You know, um, you would ask them for this particular diagnosis, are you willing to tell me what your payer mix is? At that moment, you're going to be adding to the whole spreadsheet while well, you'll be completing the whole spreadsheet, another tab, which is coming up with the proportions and the, the cost inputs that are associated with that to then determine um, those, um, uh, those adjusted, payer adjusted numbers. Terrific. And when we make it even bigger, so now we have not just the United States, but the world, mm -hmm. um, when you have to deal with single payer systems, um, modified single payer systems like in Germany, um, as well as, you know, the countries that you know, don't have healthcare systems that can pay these kind of prices. Yeah. And so then we have to come up with new modified systems to deal with those countries. Um, it starts to get awfully challenging. Um, where do companies go for help? I mean, most, especially small companies, they don't have the resources to do this yeah. by themselves. Yeah. Um, the the models that are out there is um, if you're a relatively small company, you try to build an alliance with a local company there. Um, that is going to probably take six months to just get the attorneys to agree uh, on, or find, leave enough loopholes in that they can fight each other and, and bill you more later on. Um, so that's where international partners um, come in. Um, uh, that's usually the best approach unless you can raise a lot of money for international expansion. Um, but it's also that if you want to get into, uh, let's say, the larger um, European markets, then it's better to work with a local partner um, so that it's not, uh, you know, the, that the European stereotypes can get attenuated a little bit of, you know, oh, there the Americans are coming. Uh, so. so, um, and, and I am watching the chat for additional okay. questions. Um, when we look at, um, the model and it, you looked at it very holistically, right? It's the total cost of treating the patient. Yeah. But today, you know, whether it's in Congress or in the press, the real focus is on the price of the medication 
and not the total cost of treating the patient. Yeah, I know. Um, is that, you know, in, it, it, there's what you play out in the media and then there's reality. When the insurance companies, the payers, whether they're public or private, are looking at these cost models, do they really take into account the total cost of care or is it a negotiation based on the price of the widget, which in this case is a treatment? Uh, the good payers will, they're smart enough. Uh, so the big payers and players. Where it gets trickier is if, say, um, Medicare, Medicaid may be good, certainly Medicare, uh, or government, government, uh, let's put it there, US government. There it gets trickier because, say, Medicare may compute things differently than the VA system. So their budget structure is different, may be different. Um, you know, in, in an environment like the VA where um, well, you, have, you can negotiate your drug prices and so on, um, but um, you, know, you also are taking care of patients at the same time. It is different than Medicare, which is a payer. You know, mm -hmm. think of the VA system um, as basically you know, uh, an integrated de healthcare delivery system, you know, which buys and dispenses treatments. Uh, and then that's where then you know, really the dynamics of, you know, um, I may be asking for more money on the drug end of things, but you know, look how much safer uh, it is. Um, you know, and it's not only in the media, it's also in, in the professional literature. You, you see these very superficial arguments um, of, you know, oh, they're, they're just, you know, overpriced and so on and so on. Well, first of all, uh, you have the cost of discovery um, and certainly with current products and current technologies, the cost of testing, the cost of the regulatory aspects, the um, safety aspects in the US, if you add on what you add in the total cost of liability, um, because that's a real threat in the U.S. You know, um, you're going to get sued at some point in time. Um, so that all goes in, into the pricing. So the you know the arguments of I'm going to bring down prescription drug prices. Um, that's only part of the equation. Mm. Huh. I, and I. I I thank you for that. I think that as we try and calculate, you know, what the impact is, um, you know, that is going to be very important. So if, um, and, and by the way, we are on the hour. So if people need to drop mm -hmm. off, please tell me, but um, we just got a couple more questions. Do you have a few more yeah. minutes? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Okay. All right, so um, one question is, at what point should a company conduct a product impact analysis? Is it considered part of your market validation? Is it something you should do on a repeated basis? How should they do that? Um, start as early as possible. I know that's a general statement. Um, because what you really need to do is take into account, well, part of, your budget impact is um, having a price in mind or a price range or a price corridor in mind that you want to target. But you know you need to, as you're uh, developing your drug or your technology or whatever, uh, take into account that you know, maybe some contingencies. The FDA may tell you, no, I want more analyses and you get delayed by six months. Well, six months is a lot of revenue that is lost. So you need to take into account you know, how long um, will it be and what are the contingencies before I really uh, hit the market. Um, so you know, 
the thing is start developing, you know, have your a good version control, start populating, adapting it, uh, keep good track because you need to be able to, in any discussion, explain exactly how you estimated something. Uh, so uh, th that recommendation is start as early as possible because it will also inform your pricing teams um, or your pricing vendor if you retain the vendor who is covering the markets. And so that, you know, and a lot of those vendors really do a relatively superficial job is, oh, the other ones cost this much and the administration costs and really don't look into the aspects of safety. Um, okay, so a question from the chat. Yeah. Um, so we hear a lot about Medicare's tripling, right? Which is cost, quality of life and improved outcomes. If we're measuring budget impact based on standard of care, um, it, do those align or, or do we need a new kind of a measure? Um, they align, um, especially if you take into account the full dynamics. Um, yeah. First of all, your solution needs to be just as good, at a minimum, just as good as what is out there. Um, maybe not totally as good, but then you need to also lower your price. Um, so let's assume that you're aiming for something just as good that you will not grow below that because well, you're gonna lose your investors anyway. Um, so then you said your margins, I want to be in terms of outcomes, direct outcomes, say 10% better, 15% or whatever. Um, so th that is an important aspect. Now, it also goes back again to you know, the totality of the whole picture. Um, you may have efficacy gains or effectiveness gains. Um, since with diagnostics, not only more accurate, it also gets patients treated earlier and say out of the hospital earlier, for instance. So think of those outcomes as they affect your budget impact. Now, um, you know, some people will say, well, I am gonna do a cost effectiveness analysis and then I can use that as the basis for my budget impact analysis. So that's good. Once you have those data, you can reestimate your model based upon that. All right, and so for our last question, and this is a tricky one, but a really important one. So this comes from, mem from a member of our patient community. Mm -hmm. And the question is, um, transparent industry information dissemination to the public would, be, would better prepare patients and caregivers for the potential out-of-pocket impact, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but as you and I both know, so many of these calculations and these conversations between the innovator company and the payer company are confidential contract negotiations. Mm -hmm. So how can we help the patient's budget um, for the treatment of their disease? Yeah. Well, two comments in this regard. First of all, I uh, the example that I constructed here did not have patient copay in there. Okay, um, so that's a factor to consider. If then you're going to consider several payment mechanisms, you have yet another variable in the equation. It can be integrated. Um, that is one aspect. Uh, a second one is you know, um, and you see that increasingly with patient advocacy organizations is that. You know, put it in extreme terms, they used to take money from industry. Uh, disclosure, I have lots of contracts with industry. I've had a lot of contracts with industry, you know, um, because that way they can you know, provide the services as a patient advocacy organization, their websites, materials, patient education uh, type of things. Now then, they're in a better negotiating position in that regard. You know, patient organization could say, 
yeah, we are willing to take money from you, but help us understand how you came to this price. How can we educate our... So basically you're saying you want us to educate. Well, we're now also educating about how the cost of treatment was determined, you know, and then you can get into the copay components as it may play out. Um, you know, with regard to the, the co-pays, I, I think they're also the provider organizations have a responsibility. You know, I've heard stories of people you know, getting their reminder phone call two days before the next chemo administration and being said, you know, yeah, and uh, you need to bring three thousand three thousand four hundred dollars. Uh, otherwise, we're not treating you. That was basically the message. I didn't mention. Yeah, so, or bring your credit card. <laughs> or bring your credit card, which, yeah. you know, as, as we found, and, and as I found over a decade now of working with our patient community, um, our sickest patients have maxed out their credit cards. Yep, yeah, I know. And that in this country, we're still dealing with those questions is a problem that we all need to work together to solve yeah. from industry to providers to payers to government because at the end of the day the number one person that matters yeah. is that patient and their family evo thank you so much My pleasure. And for, for joining us today and i'm looking forward to figuring out how we can have office hours with evo next year yeah. um, Stephanie, uh, no, uh, Natalie and I are talking about that later this week or next week. So we'll, we'll work something and I'm sure you, you'll let everybody know your organization and all your members. And uh, yeah, let's figure out the mechanism that I, I can do some volunteering here. And, uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you for all of the preparation that went into this folks, you know, Natalie and Evo have been working together on this for almost a year to put everything together and make it, you know, as good as it was today and in the in part one. So Evo, thank you to all of our Easy Bio peers community. Um, the year's not over yet. We still have this November and December coming up. Make sure you're following your schedule and you're in the loop. Mm -hmm. And we're really hoping that Easy Bio Peers is coming back in person in 2022. So get ready. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week and enjoy our cool fall weather in Arizona. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.